Shit. We are live. We'll give persons the opportunity for joining to share. Of course. And to tell us whether they're hearing us clearly. Are you hearing this? Loud and clear. So viewers, we thank you for joining us. We encourage you to share the live and let us know if you are hearing us loud and clear. Basically, just give them a sneak peek of the camp. I try to pull the windmill in, but the tree is hiding it. We are in the Belle camp area old PRA building yeah we'll be back so folks all these buildings belongs to the camp and the cistern over there and downstairs there used to be the kitchen we are cooking food right Good evening, good afternoon, folks. Good afternoon, Julie. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> All right, so are we ready? Oh, yeah. We're ready to go? Let me watch myself. Let me see how I look. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I look proper. It doesn't matter how you look gay, you know, it's how I put you from here. Yeah, I like the look with the ruins in the background. Of course. <laughs> yeah. And we are ready to go? We are ready to go. Pleasant good day again to you one and all. Thank you very much for joining the live. And uh, many times, people have been asking Bessie and I to speak about the history of Caricom to the Magnique. And from time to time, I'll be saying, okay, I'll get some information for you. And who I call is Mr. John Angus Martin, who is a historian, my friend. And, and I can say that there was no time that I call him and he wasn't able to provide information. Sometimes when I call, he was like, okay, well, I'll do some research and get back to you. And the same day, he gets back to me very professional, very easygoing. And I thank him for everything that he has done for us and even the growth that some people have seen in me because of this guy. Good day to you. Good day, Rina. Um, really happy to be here because, um, like I said, uh, we've been doing this for a while. Whenever you ask for anything, I am always there to help because I think that's what it's all about, is sharing the knowledge that I have, that I have gained about Karaku and I also gained from you. Um, and the stuff that you guys do because sometimes I know some of the things but I don't know um, I, I may not have been to some of the sites so it's always good when I said hey could you send me some pictures uh -huh. you know and things like that so you can share with me and I can give my insight on some of these um, so yeah it's really been fun watching explore Karaku and Pity Martinique because I think it's the kind of stuff that really um, probably the most in-depth exploration of our um, island's history so you to really share that um, that information with people out there or just people here sometimes that may not know some of the things about the thing the things that they see in their community so, so I'm really happy to be here and to be in Karakul <laughs> <laughs> where else would you want to be so to people on the live are they hearing us clearly busy I, I want they are. I want the song to be, the audio oh, to be so really good. Do you think you want to come closer? Nah, you guys are fine. All right. So everyone on the live, let us know if you're hearing us clearly or if you think that Basie should get a bit closer. I ain't coming closer because you're too gongory on the jungle. 
I think you should come a bit closer, Betty. Rina nah, it's fine. Rina it's fine. Rina Rina miss some Congo <laughs> Yeah. Lovely. It's fine. Right. So, in growing up, while I was in school, I remember I never liked the history. Betty, and I can say the same for you. You never liked history. Never. Yet. Why you did not like history? Because. What they were teaching us about Christopher Columbus, uh, it made no sense to us in school. Mm -hmm. I mean, and the, the thing about it is remembering those dates. Exactly. Uh, but if you are there, taught me, well, Tom Freeze right. had five sugar mills, and there was a cotton mill in Craigston and there, then of course. I would have taken more interest in history. And now I'm taking it in history because of Mr. Angus Martin sharing a lot of information with us and for me being forward. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> and I'm sure that a lot of people can testify to the same thing. In growing up, we were taught someone else's history, not our history. And because of that, we didn't have a true appreciation for it. And then doing our research, getting in contact with you and from what you've been telling us, then we were able to go from point A to point B and see it for ourselves. And there is nothing like physically seeing Dumfries. You hear of Dumfries, we had a lime factory in Dumfries and it was in the instrumental in the production of lime. And we can go to Dumfries and actually see it for ourselves. So hence the reason we like we started liking history. So today we're going to speak a bit about Karaku and Guinea Karaku and Fitima Nick. Because every time I know that you wrote a book about Grenada's history, right? And then the one for Karakou and Pichimatnik is coming. So today is Karakou and Pichimatnik Day. A lot of people in Karakou and Pichimatnik, they want to know about the history. So we're going to start from the beginning. Tell us about the Grenadines. Where right. about Karakou and Pichimatnik being part of the Grenadines, even though we are the sister islands of Grenada. Explain to us. Right. Well, the Grenadines has a pretty interesting history, and, and from the word itself, Grenadines, should give you some idea of its connections to Grenada. Um, <clears throat> actually, Grenada used to be Granada, um, the name that was given by the Spanish, you know, in the 1520s, and that name got stuck. But it was Granada y Granadillos, um, Grenada and the small Grenadas, basically, because as you can see from the islands right off of Grenada. Of the northern tip they're basically from there all the way through to Karakou and Piti Martinique the islands are very connected almost seem to be connected um, so I think they, they, they whereas Bekwe is probably like eight miles off of St. Vincent so there's a great distance between St. Vincent and Bekwe compared to all the islands and how they're connected to Grenada so they've always been that connections and possibly I think because St. Vincent um, in the early um, history may have had a population of black Caribs, escaped slaves and stuff, that they were a little bit off limits. So there was the connection, so all of the Grenadines were connected to Grenada. And that happened even in the, in the early period when Grenada was being sold to different people, the Grenadines were always attached to Grenada. So you're saying from <laughs> Bigway, Kanawan, Mostic, Maru, Yunnan Island, all these islands belong to they Grenada? They all belong to Grenada. That's why they're called the Grenadines. And the Grenadines, the, the word Grenadines itself is actually the Dutch rendition of Granadios. So, and that name became more popular. So that's why we ended up with the, the Grenadines, which is what we call it today. And, and so it used to be Grenada and the Grenadines, long before it was St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Right. Oh, really? Tell us yeah. more. Yeah, so we basically, um, in... In 1763, uh, in, in the, in, in, when the British took over Grenada and St. Vincent, St. Vincent was considered a neutral island because it was left to the Caribs or the Kalinago. That was a treaty signed between the British and the French. So they left Dominica, um, St. Lucia and St. Vincent. They were called neutral islands, even though they were French people living on them. So when the British took, took Grenada and the other, um, those, these other islands, um, St. Lucia ended up staying with the, with the French, but Dominica, St. Vincent, Grenada became British. And they actually were part of the same government. It was called the government of the Southern Caribbean Islands. 
Um, so eventually they kind of broke off and formed their own government, but Grenada and the Grenadines ended up staying by itself. So when the, the, during the next war, the War of American Independence, when Grenada in 1779 was taken by the French and some of these other islands were taken back by the French, the British, uh, it was actually the governor of St. Vincent, um, Valentin Morris, um, he basically suggested that Grenada, um, that the Grenadines, the islands close to St. Vincent, be given to St. Vincent because if the French got back Grenada, they would be on the doorstep of St. Vincent. So it was basically for um, security, security reasons right. that he suggested that. So when the French, when the when the British regain Grenada in 1783 and would keep it for the rest of the time, they when they appointed their new governors for St. Vincent and um, and Grenada, they cut the islands. So from Karakou south went to Grenada and above Karakou went to St. Vincent. Um, why, did, why did they cut it in that way? That's an interesting, a lot of people talk about gunpoint being, being, um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't like Kogoris. A lot of people talk about gunpoint being the, the demarcation, which means it's on Karakou and that was given that belongs to St. Vincent. I have found no evidence to show that. There's probably something to it, but I have found no evidence. What I found interesting is that if you add up the area of the Grenadines that St. Vincent has and Grenada have, it's almost the same. Because Karakou being the largest. Karakou being the largest, twice time the size of the Bekwe. other mm -hmm. of Bekwe. Mm -hmm. But for the longest while, people used to think Bekwe was actually the largest. Right. Yeah. So that is a misconception. Even Labat, who wrote the, one of the first history of the of the islands and stuff, he made that mistake as well. And Bekwe is actually was on the on the map of the island long before Karakou ended up being identified on the islands. You used to see a little rock, but it never really said Karakou. You know, it's, I think it's it's like the 1740s is where we see Karakou showing up on the map. And like Bekwe, Karakou, the name Karakou is an indigenous name. Um, people say it's called Land of Reefs, but there really is no evidence for that, that, that um, name. Um, I think that's a recent, if you look at the data, it's somebody did that recently in the 1980s. Uh, before that, there really was no um, indication as to what the name means, but there's a, a gentleman, in um, a historian in Guadeloupe, who actually took a lot of the island's names, the indigenous ones, and break them down, tried to find their meet, meanings, and for Karakou, he looks, he says, it's two words, Kari and Iku, and he breaks it down as um, land of um, pigeon? pigeon, the Ramia pigeon, which is was our first national bird before it was replaced by um, by the Grenada dove. And we actually have an island that's called Ramier Island off Grenada, which is the name is now Glover Island, I think. Um, so so there were these birds, I guess, that, that, that were identified with the island. And even Duterte, when he was coming through here in, what, 16, 1652, something like that, he talks about these pigeons that on the island and he actually makes reference to this weird noise that he heard on the island associated with birds, which could have been a reference um, to those. So so that's, in, in, in putting the Karakou in perspective, um, Karakou was the largest island and it was one of the first islands settled, but it wasn't settled until around the 1740s. We actually, we, the first indication we have is a census from 1750, which chronicles 199 people on the island. Um, a mix of whites, free coloreds, or free blacks, and um, French, with several of them being married. So that we had these mixed marriages at that, at that period. So in 1750, we get a first indication of people living on Karakou. So, and when you look at the population and stuff, it really, it's hard to, to believe that it would go back before 1740 because we don't really hear much about Karakou as a place where people are residing. But the islands were used by pirates and stuff, um, and, and privateers. So people, when they go steal, make a raid against another island, they will show up in these islands because it was easy to hide. Right. You know, if they want to disguise their boat or do any kind of thing like that, they would show up. Um, I think in the, 
in the 1720s we know of the pirates i think it was black bear one of them who took a slave ship that was actually going between grenada and um, martinique and he ended up dumping a lot of the enslaved people the captives on Karaku, and he took some with him and he left and normally they would have gone and just sold them somewhere that's that's what they would have done so we do see the islands being used for these illegal activities so if you want to go buy some slave somewhere you'll end up in one of these islands looking to see who might be hiding some contraband because the french government used to patrol sometimes to catch um people doing illegal activities of sorts in these high hidden places because there were no government in these little islands so it was easy to hide any kind of thing okay, so yeah. interesting. very much uh, yeah so to everyone who joined in the live i encourage you share the live so everyone will hear about Karaku and Sir Peter Matnik about our history. I know many times people always ask about our history. So now we're hearing it. And if you have any questions, basically, make sure not to see if anyone posing any questions and be sure to ask. We'll try to answer it. Mr. I Martin, will try my best. you always say, don't call you Mr. Martin, call you Angus. So, Angus. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Martin was my father. <laughs> Right, so what we refer to now as uh, villages, they were once estates, am I right or yes. wrong? Yes, yes. Right, so let's speak about that period now, the estates in Karakul, what was produced, the first thing produced in Karakul, what were some of the crops, and right. let's speak about that. So we said, you know, it looks like in the 1740s, people start coming to, to Karakul and Pitti Martinique. Um, Grenada at that point was pretty developed in the sense that there were over 80 sugar plantations in Grenada. There was a population of probably 14,000 people in Grenada, the majority of course being enslaved people. So a lot of the land was already given out to people coming to Grenada because places like Martinique and Guadeloupe were pretty filled up in terms of people have already gotten all the lands and they had lots of sugar plantations and stuff. So people were coming to the other islands that may have had more access. So once Grenada filled up, then people wanted to start to go to Caraco and Pitti Martinique. Um, so they were given concessions. They would give out concessions to people um, for plantations. That's how it was done. Um, so the first people that showed up basically got free, but you had to, to clean it up. So that means you had to buy enslaved people to work these plantations by cutting off all the big trees and setting up your plantation. That took a lot of um, labor, as you can imagine removing all these big trees, lots, it, it was the, the most difficult part of establishing a plantation. Because in those days they did not have machines, right? No, it was basically axes, cutlasses, you know, the basic. Um, human labor um, did it, and a lot of it, the majority of it was slave labor. Um, in the early part of the, of, the, of the settlement, there would have been some indentured, white indentured um, French, but basically that went out pretty quickly once they were able to, to um, access get um, access to enslaved Africans, to captive Africans. So on, on Karakul we see in the 1740s or 1750s under the French, um, we said 200 people living here almost split between um, half and half between enslaved and, and free people. And the crop that was, the big crop that was growing then was indigo and cotton. Cotton was a little bit, but indigo was a big crop. Um, indigo, it's it's hard to imagine um, indigo production today because you know we, we know talk about indigo dye and stuff, but nobody really actually. I think it's synthetically produced now. You don't even need the plants themselves to do it. Um, and Karaku probably has the only ruins. Um, of that indigo production in, and as well, um, compared to Grenada as well, because Grenada was also a large indigo producer. That was the first crop that really kicked off in Grenada, the late 1600s and up until the 1730s. Indigo was the big crop. We had rid of <laughs> Congaree made it up. <laughs> like it <laughs> i love it <laughs> i guess we are really out we are in the outdoors <laughs> the congaree want to find interesting places i guess <laughs> michael <laughs> Bill, but you must have heard that scream the volume can never be low <laughs> 
Is the volume low? You want to come closer? Michael, you want to Go ahead. So, yeah, we were, we were talking about um, about the plantations in, 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 in Karakou. So, Indigo, we have, um, and I think it would be interesting to do some work in that area. It's, it's around the Ningo well, and the Ningo is the most likely derived from Indigo. Yeah. Um, and it's a really unique well, not just in Karakou, but I think in even throughout the, the Grenadines and some of the other islands. Because we really don't have too many wells in some of these other islands. But again, the Grenadines, the reason for these wells is because they never had permanent streams. Right. Um, they might have some kind of streams during the rainy season, but, um, but the wells were basically the things, that's how they got water. Um, everybody had cisterns, some kind of cistern. Um, connected to their house and that's they collected rainwater. So these wells were necessary for indigo production because indigo needed water um, to soak the leaves and, and the, the, as part of the processing. Uh, right next to the indigo well, to the ningo well is um, some ruins in the bush um, where you can see the bats that they were using to process indigo. Another indication of that area being um, being in indigo production areas that they actually have wild indigo plants that still survive in the in the, in the immediate area of the well. Um, I think I would one of the things I always keep saying every time I come to Karakou, I need to go do some research on the wells. I take measurements and things like that, but it's quite a lot of bush around it. But that would be one of the things I think that would confirm, you know, for sure that we had that these islands were producing indigo as, as their first crop. Um, one of the things they said they stopped producing indigo is that they, when indigo was being processed, it gave, off, it gave off fumes. And that fumes was responsible for the death of enslaved people who were working uh, the indigo um, processing. Poisonous fumes. Poisonous fumes, because um, the indigo basically in soaking in the water and you couldn't leave it too long because you didn't want it to start fermenting because you lost you would lose some of your indigo um, dye if you allowed it to ferment so there was a real intricate process that was necessary to to produce the dye um, so that is that is one of the first crops um, that Karakou would have produced and they were one of the last places to produce indigo in Grenada and, and, and the Grenadines um, cotton became the next big crop, and actually Karakou produced co co cotton up until the early, early 1980s, and Pity Martinique as well. So cotton was really the real big production. Where we sit in here, this is actually um, part of the Bel Air estate where sugar was produced. Um, and this sugar production didn't start until the 18, um, 1820s, the early 1820s. Um, there were one or two other plantations in Karakou that, that were producing sugar cane, uh, Limle was one of them, um, but Bele was one of the ones, there were about two or three of them that started producing sugar in the 1820s. What about Granby? Granby was an early one. Granby was one that was producing since the 1700s, the late 1700s under the British. Um, so, so you have basically a handful of plantations on Karakou that did produce um, sugar cane, that produced sugar from sugar cane. But there were, like I said, it was about four or five of them, um, maybe even as many as six by the, the 18, before the, just before the end of slavery. Um, so, so we do see some changes when the British come in, but cotton became the biggest crop. And Karakou was producing, and the rest of the Grenadines, as a matter of fact, was producing a lot of cotton. And that cotton um, went to... A large part of it went to Scotland, which they then referred to as North, um, the, the Northern England, um, because Karakou had a very big Scottish influence, um, which is reflected in the names. When you hear names like Dumfries and Craigstone, Craigston and Argyle, um, though that's an indication that all the Scots um, owners who were in Karakou. Um, and that played out and one of the things that we did in looking at the even the big drum dance looking at the timni nation specifically in the big drum dance we found that the survival of a very small west african tribe the timni from sierra leone 
was actually due to the to the to the to the Scots, because they own plantations in Karakou and they own plantation they own the, the slave island in Sierra Leone called Bunce Island, or mm. Bance Island. Um, so they basically was trading directly to the other Scottish because of their Scottish networks. So and one of that is Grand Bay that was owned by Mills, mm -hmm. where Rena's name is derived from. It, the guy name was actually Mill, and the Karakou Mills name derived from that. Um, John Mill, and he also had shares in Buns Island. Uh -huh. um, so that's the connection between, and we know that um, there's actually other connections um, because the Mill family were involved in slave trading as well. So there is that deeper connection between this tiny island um, and slavery um, in West Africa. So we see a concentration of, of Timney and, and others as well, and um, Tibni is a very small ethnic group in Sierra Leone, um, but dominant, um, and you can, and which may be some of the reasons why they actually survive in the the big drum dance, and maybe other neighboring people from that area in Sierra Leone also associated with them once they came here, so they may have benefited from other ethnic groups close by, but nonetheless. Um, connected with the Timney and, and made them known their language and things like that. So we do see some of these interesting things that, that Karakou is noted for today that starts developing in that period, um, in the late 1700s. Okay. You mentioned mill becoming mills. Mm -hmm. Tell us how the S was added. And right. Let's speak a bit about the surnames now. Right. Surnames, it's... it's Interesting when we look at the surnames of Grenadians today, um, there is you know, the, the common belief that Grenadians were named after their slave masters. But one of the things you need to be aware of is that there were many slave masters that never even came here. They never lived in the islands. They were absentee owners. So their name was really not known, you okay. know, on the island. Um, so like there's nobody who are named Urquhart, um, Urquhart and, and such who owned Craigston and, and Meldrum, um, or the people who owned Limley, which was Lemley, that was the, the Scottish name. So all of these places, but we know the Robertson family had owned Candice, that's where the name came from, it's a Scottish name. So all of these little places all over were owned by these different families that came from Scotland and settled in Karakou and own neighboring plantations. Oh, so, for example, like Monroe, Monroe owned exactly, Limlair. Exactly, exactly, yeah. the Monroe from family Scott, was okay. from Limlair, right. yeah, or Lemley actually, it became yeah. Limlair in, in the spelling today. Mm -hmm. um, so the name I found interesting, I guess I have probably looked at too many documents and I saw a pattern that I decided to explore that the majority of Grenada's um, names today are a reflection of the names that we see on slave registers. Because we have the registration of, of enslaved people in Grenada from 1817 to 1834 and by plantations. Because they had to keep a record because they wanted to prove that no illegally um, purchased and um, captives were not being brought in to the population. So they had to record everybody. So anybody who was born, anybody who was died was recorded on these registers. So we really have for a good decade or more, we actually have a, a list of all these names. Again, there's just one name. So we're talking about John, Mary. And if there were two Marys, one would be Mary first and Mary second. Okay. Sometimes they have Mary old or Mary young hmm. to separate the, the different people. Um, so we, there's always, you know, the, these, the belief that names were given to people, but we actually believe that the enslaved people gave their own names, even though there was Mary, John, and whatever, but the grandmothers and other older people in the community actually are the ones who were the ones who were given names. Again, it's, it's really, we don't have a lot of evidence for it, but we, we know that, that they probably were part of the naming process because we have um, enslaved kids who were born in Karakou having African names, which is an indication that the names would probably be given by an African parent, but not by a slave owner or a manager on the estate. And, and one of the proofs for me is actually from Karakou, in my theory on, on, on Grenadians, that the majority of names derive from these um, enslaved people's first names. 
in Karakou and, and in Grenada as well, there were many people with both African, um, female and male African names. So we had females like Abba and, and stuff like that, different Adu, um, different names. And we had Kofi, Kwamina, um, the, uh, many of them Ghanaian, um, uh, Ashanti names, that, uh, day names that you see keep being repeated. So it's interesting for me that those specific names, and we have about four or five of them, became last names in Grenada, and many of them exclusive to Karakul, where you do see the, the coffee and, and such, uh, Kojo, um, more prominent here than in Grenada as, as a last name. And that to me was some of the proof, whereas there's no female African name that survived as a family name in Grenada or Karakul just the male ones which is a common practice throughout europe and everywhere where you take the name of your father and we do have they actually on two registers in karakou on the slave register we have an indication where one a gentleman married a lady and all of the kids at a certain point the, the kids were renamed his name his first name he only had one name but the kids ended up with two names and that and their last name was his first name okay so these are the indications, indications right. that that's how some of the naming so i think it's it's we have to be careful sometime when we take something from somewhere else because the, given the, the plantation owner name was a very common practice in north america right. in in the south of the u.s that was a very common practice you see a name and you can connect it back to a slave owner okay. but in in Karakou and grenada we see a different um, thing that normally the people who may have had slave um, a name of a slave master that they were actually related to them in blood so okay. it might have been a kid a grandkid or something like that um, and uh, Trinidad had a different name in process when they came to do the registers they gave people the person doing the register and doing the, the census of the enslaved people on plantations gave them last names Okay. So it's a very so they were different. We, there's a story in um, Curacao that they gave them the plantation owners gave them the last name of the wife's first name. So you end up with a lot of feminine family names Feminines. in Curacao. So th there were different ways of doing it, and and each that's why you really need to pay attention to specific islands because they were run differently. So you have different outcomes, and and I think that's the case and. Like I said, it's when I really started paying attention to Karakou, the registers from Karakou, and I look at the, the occurrence of these names and then extrapolate them to the, the, the prevalence of the names today, you see a correlation between the registers and this. So that's how I think it's, it's probably a better indication of how people in Grenada and Karakou and Pitney Martinique um, got their, their last names. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I remember us speaking about uh, some of the last names that came over the enslaved who came over i'm um, carrying the last name did you say one of it is kwashi and kojo kwashi kojo kwamin kwamina. kwamina yes those were three and and Ko kojo yeah. kwashi kojo kofi Kwa kwamina. kwamina those are four of the 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 three names there is one there's aki uh -huh. aki is another aki is another name that also survives in grenada um as a name that came over as it was, it was a first name as well. That's well, I, you know, Rina Mills seems like she's watching the comments because somebody, not somebody, Ria Batiste just mentioned about the Kojo. Mm -hmm. oh. And you spot on, <laughs> said, talked about the Kojo. Right. She's also, also saying that the government of Grenada and the Ministry of Education should make it a reality for you, what you're saying here now, to be taught in schools we go and advocate yes, to that yes i agree Rhea, and Rhea is a teacher yeah, so uh -huh, uh -huh. i've been she, saying that to him for the longest while yeah so let's well, I, hope that i think there is when you talk about having an interest in history if you're learning about yourself yeah you might have a greater interest exactly you that's know? what we want to hear and i think i think any any government that really that says we care about what our kid, children learn, we care about our history, we care about our culture, then you have to make sure that that history and culture is taught in the school. Very much. I think um, 
we have neglected as you say you learned about columbus the kings and queens of of england Learn, yeah. you know um, we know more about um like i think merle collins have a really cool poem where she has a line a line in it that says my grandmother didn't know anything about african prince of, of king kings or even kalinago chief she knew about Henry VIII and, 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 yeah, you know, yeah, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I think it's it's an indication of how British education system was really, really transformed. You know the the knowledge that that people had and, and gained. You know and neglected to to talk about the local environment, the things you see around. Like people see old windmill towers and stuff, and people are like, so how did that get there? What was that? <laughs> You know, like in the bottom, the the belly, the other windmill tower that people see there, people would say they used to produce sugar there. But actually, that was the corn mill and the cotton mill. You know, there's a difference between that windmill and this, this one, one up, up here. here. You see the yeah. size of it. You see how it's it's differently constructed. The different spaces in it were for different things because this required you to put the cane in one end. Once it's ground, it's brought out to another. They left a bigger space in case they had to go repair the machine. The machinery in there yeah. so you, you needed it was a very different structure mm -hmm. you know so so i think those are the things that you know i said nobody taught us about these things mm -hmm. yeah. you know i had to go and learn this myself i think i think the way our curriculum is structured um when you look at the fact that cxc is from caribbean wide wide we lose some local detail mm, yeah. like grenadians learn about maroons in jamaica Everybody yeah. know about Nanny and, and Kojo and mm. stuff, but they don't know about Maroons in Grenada. Yeah, yeah. That Grenada has a whole history of Maroons. Yeah. You know, so I think that's that's one of the, the problems, I think, when we have a region, right? Because for Jamaica, Barbados and Trinidad, they have done more research into their history. So it's more readily available. Right. So that becomes part of the curriculum easily, right. as opposed to Grenada's history and culture. You know, mm. in any of that stuff, in any of the plantations that you might discuss in Caribbean history, there is nothing about a Grenadian plantation. You know, that Dumfries on Karakou had the largest number of enslaved people, yeah. even than Grenada. Over 400 enslaved people were on Dumfries. And thus, Karakou had a very fertile land for cotton. And they were producing sugar there as well. Right. You know, um, so these are the kind of things I think we need to learn about you know and teach that stuff in school right. and, and until we teach that in school we're going to still be ignorant of the things right around us and how our ancestors lived and, and what they had to do because we just assume things based on other islands and, 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 and um, that we learn about in school so I think we need to do a better job of teaching history in the lower grades yes. um, and making history mandatory especially local history yes. And we need to do much more in, in sharing that knowledge about Grenada's history with Grenadians. Yeah. Well said. <laughs> Whoa, what food for thought. That we will not be like a tree without a root. No, exactly. Without us knowing our history. So I wanted to speak about our folk parents, the journey about them coming here mm -hmm. and how they were distributed on the various estates. Right. But because you mentioned um, maroon, should we start speaking about maroon and we'll go back to that? Let's go there first. All right. And then we can come back. Okay. So, yeah. I um, can't wait. <laughs> all enslaved people, the majority of enslaved people that came to Karakou first landed in Grenada. Ah. Um, the enslaved people would be brought to Grenada on, in the Carnage. And we're talking for the period that we have data for. Five, we have over 550 slave ships came into the harbor in, on the Carinage. So were they enslaved who were to be distributed in Grenada, Caracom, Pitch Madness? Well, many of them were brought to Grenada, but some of them ended up going to other islands as well, being oh. sold off on other islands. Um, but if before that, this is what we have, we know of, but there are much more enslaved people that came to Grenada because there are lots of things we don't have the records for. Because under the French, many of them came via Martinique. So they came in smaller boats and they were not recorded as they didn't come directly from Africa. They went to Martinique first and then were resold in Grenada, which Grenada would later do. You have enslaved people coming into Grenada, but Grenada would sell later to Trinidad and Guyana and some of these other places. 
Um, really? So Grenada was a real one of the big ports bringing in, you know, after the British came in. So he said, for Little Grenada, we have 550 slave ships recorded for coming into Grenada. I wonder why Grenada. Grenada. Well, Grenada was the seat of the government. Grenada was the most developed of the Windward Islands. So we, we had the, the seat of the, the government for the south, Southern Caribbean Islands was Grenada. So Grenada had a governor, whereas the other highlands had lieutenant governors. Um, so Grenada was, like I said, the most developed at the time. So that's why there was uh, a lot of stuff centered here. Um, and the fact that our proximity to South America as well, uh, for trade with the, with the Spanish, we got a lot of animals, you know, mules and, and, and things like that, cattle came in from South America because people don't realize for every sugar plantation, you needed a lot of um, animals. animals. Animals were used for the manure that they produced, but also um, animals was beast of burden. Yeah. You could not have, it it's wasn't just enslaved people that were being used in that way, but you actually had some, <laughs> the early form of mechanization where at these that animals the were carrying, yes, they were moving yeah. some of the, the cane and things like that, you know. Yeah. So, and, and so you spin the mill. Um, yes, there were cattle mills. Yeah, we do know that there were some cattle mills um, in Grenada, and, and Karakou may have had some before they had windmills. There may have been some cattle mills. They were the easiest mills to set up. Mm -hmm. So we do see um, that that many plantations had, you know, sometimes even over a hundred um, cattle that were necessary for the production the, the large sugar plantations. Um, again, those are things that are really absent because people rarely talk about, you know, the animals. During Fedon's Rebellion in Grenada, that became the food for all the rebels. They would just walk, going and taking animals everywhere and they were slaughtered and I think what, seven a day or something like that to feed all these rebels. Um, so once the re rebellion was over, they actually had to bring in all these animals again to restart the plantations. But that is something that you rarely hear been mentioned, yeah. you know, the animals and the role they played um, in, in the production and, and, and on all these plantations. So, um, so all the enslaved people came through Grenada. Um, the ships came into the, into the, into the carnage. Um, around the carnage. Before, before getting to Grenada, mm -hmm. let's speak about getting them from Africa, how they were kept, where they were stored, the journey about that, about right. with them coming across. Right. So, um, Grenada had got enslaved over, we're talking about, um, about 150,000 um, enslaved people. Um, that's, that we, that, that's recorded. It was more than that because we have lots of people in the court. Illegal, in the early period, there were lots of illegal um, enslaved people brought in, and that was never recorded um, on any paper. So we're looking at much more, um, you know, probably thousands more. Yeah. that would have been brought in. But for the ones that we have data for, um, so we're looking at Sierra Leone, um, Liberia area. Um, that was one of the, the, the big areas, Bons Island being the slave, um, the slave island. Uh, then you go over to Ivory Coast, um, and they, they, what they call the Windward Coast, I guess was um, Liberia and, and right around there. Then you go to the Gold Coast, which was Ghana. Um, there were several slave castles. One of them was at Komomanti, and that became known as the Komomanti slaves, even though Komomanti is not an ethnic group name. Okay. But it became a group, it became an identity in the Caribbean. Today, in the big drum dance, mm -hmm. you have Komomanti. Right. But that's because they came from Port Am it was Fort Amsterdam in Ghana. And they, the name of the area was Cromomantine, and that's where the enslaved people came from. Or anybody that came through that port became known as Cromomantine. Right. So that's how the name became almost as a tribal yeah, name. Thing. Right. Yeah, but, they, um, but uh, the majority of them were um, Ashanti okay. and Kanai or Akan. Um, that spoke Twee, that's where we get a lot of the Anansi stories and all that stuff from. So you had. Um, and then the other place would have been uh, Nigeria um, and Cameroon. And then we're talking about Angola and yeah. Congo area. Congo. So you had these four areas where the majority of enslaved people that came to Grenada um, were taken from. So the ships would basically leave France or, or the UK, go down with packed with 
with but material. Take a pin there. In mm -hmm. terms of the place that you just named, mm -hmm. where they were taken from, mm -hmm. and in relation to the different tribes who came from, who were brought here from Africa, right? are you able to tell which tribe were from where? Well, I think the only indication that we have is for Karakul, especially yeah. because they maintain the big drum dance. Right. So you have people up until some years ago, they could tell you, I am Igbo, you know, I am Cromanti, yeah. you know, I am Temne, you know, um, which is what got me excited because I lived among the Temne in Sierra Leone. So I'm like, wait, there's some kind of connection there. So I think those are some of the things um, that Karakul and, and Grenada used to have nation dances as well. Actually, even now, even today, they'll have ceremonies in River Sally mm -hmm. and Munich and places like that where they still celebrate nation dance, but they have no, they've lost the, the narrative the narratives, right. of the nation, the nation that they were, but they still celebrate these dances as nation dance and they do the Saraka similar to what you would do here, you know, so, so that was a common thing that the groups, but they cook a different food. Yes, because again, when we look at Karakou was able to maintain a lot of their own because of the isolation of the Grenadines. Okay. Um, whereas Grenada, because it was really, and if you look at where these places in Grenada that maintain um, that singularity, that um, emphasis on, on these African derived elements, um, it's all the way north of the island, the furthest from St. George's. And also one of the most interesting thing is that indentured Africans settled in a lot of these northern villages um, that's why you see the northern area of Grenada St. Patrick's especially and even um, St. Andrew yeah. where you see and some of the masquerades that you see develop in those areas yeah you know like you would hear they say La Potrie and Tivoli and, and Monk Rich and those places they play a really bad car, Jab Jab mm -hmm. and, 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 and Short mm -hmm. Knee and stuff like that so you do see this certain elements of it still in Grenada, but they have lost the narrative much more so than Karakou, where they have all the songs and stuff that they still sing, mm. you know, so they maintain, you know, um, that narrative. Okay. Right. So let's go back to um, how for parents get in here, the right. get in here. So basically at these slave castles all along the coast, mm -hmm. and sometimes in just general areas as well, they would, um, they would have people to sell local Africans uh, would be the ones that bring Africans from the coast um, through various means kidnapping wars you know not really horrible ways take people to the coast have them ready to be sold so when these slave ships come they will readily exchange for guns ammunition um, cloth um, cowrie shells cowrie shells became a currency cowrie shells are not native to Africa and that's why you could use it as a currency. They actually came from East, uh, East, um, East India um, Ocean. Um, they were from the Maldives or the Maldives Island. That's where cowrie shells were actually came from, taken to Europe and then put on ships and, and, and brought to West Africa and used as a currency. Um, metal, iron, um, became part of the, the exchange. So you can, um, we have one narrative by Utaba Kugano, who was captured in um, Ghana in what is today Ghana so in one of these you know probably could have been Cromanty area and he was taken to actually you know, I think it was um, Cape Coast Castle he may have been brought to and he came to Grenada as an enslaved probably working on the Tivoli um, plantation he was eventually taken to the UK by his master because he was a servant boy to him and he eventually got his freedom and he would be the first African to write a book against slavery in English um, and so he's in a good example and he talks about the, the being captured in his village um, by a neighboring a neighboring tribe he was caught out he was playing um, and then taken to the coast and, and he relates all of that pretty horrible experience wow. and and how he was put on a ship and, and then taken you know we do have another um, we do have another narrative of a, a slave ship that was um, called the Hudibras that mm. took um, it was written by a young English teenager on the ship. Um, he was in his teens when he ended up, he ran away from home and ended up on a slave ship. And he relates the journey. On that ship, there was a rebellion. The enslaved, the captives tried to rebel. It was put down. Many of them were, were killed. Um, but he relates that and how 
Um, so we have an idea of the journeys and, and how people were, how the captives were brought on board, how they were kept on board, how they were eventually sold. He relates that coming into the Karanash and relating that they would clean up, clean up the enslaved people, grease them down with, um, with palm oil to make them shine, and, and, you know. And he said that oh, the, for market. Yes, and they would dye their hair for anyone who might have a little grain in their hair. They didn't really? want to show. Yeah, because you wanted to show because you would get more That's money fun. for more the money ones that for look the healthier. One that look plumps. Yes. Ah. So they would. Um, so they, he, he even relates that the, the the stronger ones were kept on the deck, and they got a little bit upset because they were trying to say, "Why are you hiding us?" But they they had to tell them that's because we want a bigger price for you. Later on, after we sell the ones who could get a lesser price, we'll sell you later. Wow. So, so a lot of times the sale, the sale took place right on the ship. Or if the ship wanted to leave, they would sell them to a local broker. Wow. Um, and those were held in yards along the carnage. So the carnage had these like a building with a, with a yard. And that's where the enslaved people. People think that slaves were sold in the market square. Slaves were not sold in the market square. Oh, really? No. I've been always hearing that. No, that's the, the see, auction. That that is something that happened in the U.S. So we end up taking a lot of other people, and it may happen in other islands. But wow. that's the thing. In Grenada, um, enslaved people were sold on the ships or on the carnage. We actually even have some advertisements, you know, um, where where the um, the first Caribbean bank is, mm -hmm. where Barclays Bank used to be on that hill. That we know the building that used to be there, and there was the in the parking lot was probably where they kept slaves to, for sale because we have an advertisement from 1799 that talks about um, the, um, slaves for sale in that in that area all and my life I've been sorry sorry to this but all my life I've been hearing the slaves who were brought to the market, market square to be auctioned that's like I said that's not something that we see in Grenada there is even uh, a the little in, Grenada. The, in the one in Grenada there's actually a little monument to emancipation uh -huh, put there uh -huh. because of that uh -huh. but what we did have in the market square was called a cage and the name tells you so they were not brought there no but when you escaped when you ran away or they picked you up somewhere they took you to the cage uh -huh. so you were held in the cage and they would put an advertisement in the newspaper saying so and so and sometimes the person gave the name or not and they might tell them ask them who their owner is so they would give that information that would be put in the newspaper and said so and so is in the cage if you don't collect them within a certain time they will be sold, sold to pay for their food that had they have been given in the cage right. so we had cages there were cages in different towns mm. and that's where runaway were brought and sometimes if a, if a slave behaved badly they would send them to the cage to be punished so that's what we had in the market square not a place where you auctioned you know um, the auction most take place and there were advertisements in newspapers you could check the old Grenada newspapers wow. uh, we have auctions somebody auction. selling somebody selling a family maybe or something they'll tell you we have X amount of slaves mm -hmm. and they give you the things about them this one is five foot nine inches his name is this he's good at doing this the whatever mm -hmm. skills so all of that ended up in the newspapers mm -hmm. so there was no need to go have these auctions they would have an auction though if somebody's estate Somebody died and they had to auction off the estate, but they didn't bring people. Really? They just basically had a, they, the auction was an auctioneer in front of people who were interested in buying. Okay. So that's what, what would have taken place. Take place. And they actually had a place called, I think it was the meeting hall or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's a room in a building where they would carry out these auctions. And if the government confiscated a property or whatever, then they would have these auctions, but it was not a physical you this, come off, the, come off the boat yes. and, and everybody line no, up there. Okay. No, no because wow. the evidence we have does not support that. that. Yeah. Yeah, remember that if you're viewing this and you have a question to ask, please post your question in the comment section. Yeah. So they were brought in Grenada and right. brought over to Karakou. Right, because when they were brought in Grenada, if somebody in Karakou wanted them, they would contact mm -hmm. somebody in Grenada, either go to Grenada if they were looking to buy additional um enslaved people they would contact somebody a manager or whoever in grenada and say hey i'm looking for xyz mm -hmm. and they would purchase and they would put them on one of these schooners and then make the journey to do you to know Calico. where they entered from 
They would, they would show up. We do. They they would show up wherever, depending on the size of the boat and and stuff like that. But we do have evidence. For example, we have um, um, someone coming into Karakou, and he said, you know, we landed so and so. We landed in Hillsborough. Oh, actually, the big fort was also at Turo Bay. So they would land at these different places. So there were lots of landing areas where a boat can come in, and then you would ride a horse or whatever. To the plantation okay um so yeah so people were taken to these areas they would end up walking from wherever they landed many plantations had access to the sea because if you had to take off the produce you didn't want it to go over land even though Karaku had a good system of roads which probably was because of that um but if you wanted to get into a ship as quick as possible you know you would probably find a, an area where you can bring a boat and fill the boat up with whatever and you would bring in supplies as well so in these landing areas so it, they would along the certain coast the, the eastern coast and the southern coast is easier to land than, to on land the, than yeah. the eastern coast you know so it all depend on the time of the year and which was you know how the, the sea was where people would land but they had smaller craft so they'll have the big boats the schooners then they would load it into the smaller boats and those were the ones that would come ashore do you yeah. know where the first port in Karakou was located? Yes, it actually was in the south of the island. Mm. Um, that was where the first, and they actually um, called the, the, what was it? Um, so you said Cyril Bay? Yes, that area was the first, was the first, mm. first port. And where did the, um, and the British moved it to Hillsborough. Okay. Was um, it in Grand Bay at any point? No, but that they would have had a land in there. Um, lots of the estates had their own landing. They would probably have had a jetty um, to have their landing because when they want, they would take stuff from Hillsborough and then go around the island in a smaller boat um, and make it easy to, to um, or overland, depending on where they were located. Yeah. There's so much we have to discuss, and I don't think one episode or one life can do it. No. But we started speaking about maroon, and I mm -hmm. just want us to speak a bit on maroon, our culture in Cairo, and right. the sum. We may not be able to speak about it, everything, but Angus will be back in November, so we can do some more of this. Somebody yeah, asked about to speak about the Maroons in Grenada. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Right. Um, um, I could do a quick... Yeah, um, go just for the question I posed. Right. Yeah. We actually so have... That was the next question. Yeah, in the, Maroon. the Maroons in, in Cairo. <laughs> we do have quite a lot of evidence for Maroon um, activity in Grenada. Actually... The first type of maroon in Grenada activity is called maritime marinage. People actually got boats and ran off the island. Mm. We actually have names of families that, that ran away from Grenada in boats. They would steal boats. There actually was a law passed to penalize the owners of boats who didn't secure them so that enslaved people would take those boats and go off to Margarita and Spanish because they, they got their freedom when they ended up, well, ended up in, in Spanish. That. So could you imagine stealing a boat, getting into it and going to a place you have no, no idea. idea? You know, and these are, we're talking little boats here. Mm -hmm. We're talking little fishing boats, Yeah. you know, canoes. Sometimes they would stay in the bush and make a, a canoe to get off the island. Mm -hmm. So that was the first. And I believe that the reason we had uh, maritime marinage first is because the French had an agreement with the Caribs or the Kalinago to return escaped slaves. Right. So if you ran into the bush, you could have been caught by the Kalinago and returned to, to your master. Just like in, in um, Jamaica, when the Maroons won their freedom, one of the conditions was that anybody who ran into the bush who escaped, they were going to return them right you know so this is some of the you know so we do have the the first for the first probably 60 70 years of the island a lot of the, the, a lot of the people that are leaving are by the sea and and going to going south basically wherever the ship takes them many mm -hmm. of them end up in places like margarita and, and and even the continent probably um trinidad as well so so we see a lot of evidence of that in, during the French. And then we start seeing marinage in Grenada in the 1720s and, and 30s and 40s. And, and when we have censuses that list, um, you know, people that list all the escaped people that end up in the bush. And they actually is a time when they go maroon hunting. 
which, which part of the islands are the most maroon? As you would think, it's the, the larger parishes in, in the northern parishes. Okay. So we're talking about and the, anything that borders the center of the island, basically, right. because that is the, 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 the most inaccessible part of the island. Um, so St. David's as well, you know, people go mm -hmm. up into the mountains there. Um, St. John's, we have actually have a place in, in St. John's that the locals call Guaneg Maron. Mm. Um, basically, it's the place of the escape slaves, right, right. Um, the Maroons. Um, that, and it's not on a map, of course, but it's what people remember. Um, so we do have marinage taking place under the French. There's actually an episode from the 1720s where this, um, this Maroon, basically they attack um, uh, an isolated uh, plantation and the husband was not there but the wife just had a baby and they told her if she did not kiss the backside of this slave of this maroon mm -hmm. that he would take the baby and smash the head you know they pulled her earring off and they took the earring they said they burned the, the they took the chickens you know so we have this really detailed episode of these maroons that are that are totally running um creating havoc in the in the deep bush in the countryside on some of these plantations that some of these owners actually are very scared to even remain on the plantations because the maroons come in so we have you know names of these maroons and eventually in 1726 they actually the first court local court in grenada started to try maroons because before that, they would have had to send them all the way to Martinique to be tried. Oh, and the locals say, when they get executed, they get executed in Martinique, so the people in Grenada don't get to see that. So they want them to see the executions so that they don't ever try to try become to a maroon. Right. So they started a court in Grenada in the 1720s, one of the reasons just to try the maroons um, when they're caught. So we have incidences of maroons being caught and being executed, even an incident where they cut their heads off and stick it along country roads to rot as, mm. a, as an example to show people this is what's going to happen to you if you ever try to run away. Yeah. So we have uh, maroons develop, a, a big community developed right after the French left the island because when the French, many of the French left, so the maroons basically ran away from those plantations into the hill so they created a lot of problems for the British. The British even gave amnesty to people who wanted to come back. Now, there weren't too many takers, but that's where we had a really big maroon. We had over 200 maroons in the bush in Grenada. So in the late 1700s, it becomes a really big problem. All the way up into the early 1800s, into the 1820s, we had maroons. And there were always people being caught, uh, many of them by the loyal black rangers, which was military a black military corps right. that was started in grenada during Peron's rebellion to fight the rebels right. so wow. we do have a long history, a long, of, long history. of maroons in mm. grenada um being and we, like i said the newspapers have this one was caught so and so these people were caught people from Karakou taking a boat ended up in grenada mm. you know they were caught and they, t they describe who they're looking for right. and they, they're like this one speaks french and english or this one doesn't speak any french barely any English. So they give you all these descriptions, what they were wearing when they left. So we have a lot of that so we can get a much better idea of people are trying to escape and things like that. Okay. Yeah. Let's pick Maroon in Caracom because in my context, I'm not sure if it's the same as in Grenada. Right. But from right. what I heard mm -hmm. is that, okay, what we have now as the village Maroon, right. which were all once estates, and it is said that the runaway slaves, they form themselves together in mm -hmm. the hills, they cook food, um, they make drums together. So now we celebrate in their memory by cooking the same food and um, beating drums. Right. Well, I think the, the fact that we call it maroon is an indication of where it may have derived from. Mm -hmm. So being run away, you know, you hiding up in the hills, mm -hmm. you, they form these communities. And we see it in, in much more developed maroon communities in Jamaica or in Suriname, um, where they were able to totally divorce themselves from the, the surrounding plantation society. Mm -hmm. So in some cases, they didn't really even worry about um, these other communities. But in Grenada, they weren't that far away. Grenada is a small island. So even though it was all the way up in the bush, they can, you know, they would actually have times when they would go maroon hunting. Right. They were core people that would go into the bush 
excuse to really to find search out maroons and kill them you capture them and put them in jail or whatever the case was so i think that's where the culture basically developed in the bush that idea of helping each other of when you need somebody to work you the whole community comes together to help you do your garden to build your house you know and that's where you have this culture and 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 part of that as well is that because you can do what you want you 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 keep practicing the things that you know so if you brought certain practices that you remember from africa you will do them in the bush so we have the sarakad all of these kind of ceremonies Mm -hmm. kind of become more prominent in these communities Mm -hmm. so with the end of slavery the these things were brought into the rest of the, the communities yeah. and they become very important in celebrating um, different festivals you know mm-hmm. especially around harvest time you know that's when a lot of people will celebrate or oh, it's a ma- when you you thanking the ancestors very much you know that be, that is the core of Karakus mm-hmm. in Grenada they have maroons but you don't see that element in it you know but I think Karaku again because of the big drum dance and stuff you see um how maroon becomes interwoven you know and then big drum dance and the saraka and all of that become part of the food cooking you know i think that is common throughout the caribbean Mm -hmm. you know any you know um, up until the 50s and 40s and things like that communities would get together and food cooking is an important part was an important part of it so all communities had these elements but i think you see it in different ways manifest itself in different ways Whereas Karakou, because of the ancestor worship or honoring, you see a different development. And, and that's why we, when we speak of Maroons, we're like, yeah, Grenada has this Maroon, but Karakou has, you know, these other elements. That these villages have Maroons to celebrate specific harvest stuff for rain. You know, whatever it is you want to connect it to the ancestors and asking the ancestors, you know, to come in and intervene on your behalf that your existence, your life is better. Yeah. 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 Well, that's a mouthful. So we we have spoken a lot, a lot, a lot. Before I close, while we're on call here, I just want to speak about Shakespeare Mass. We Mm -hmm. always say that Shakespeare Mass is very unique to Karaku. As a matter of fact, Karaku is the only place in the world besides Greece that one can witness this type of Mass. Mm -hmm. I've been also hearing that some people are saying, we should not recognize a Shakespeare, sorry, Shakespeare mass right. because it's not part of our culture. What's right. your views on that? Well, you know, I am a proponent of my view of, of Caribbean culture, of Grenadian culture is a creolization that, you know, different things came together, not always under good circumstances. And Grenadians in their creativity came up with these different things that for their celebrations and their expression. Um, uh, I see the Shakespeare masquerade as one of those. Um, like I said, we have pictures. We have pictures from 1911 that show a masquerade in Grenada. It was a, a between fight between Chantinel and Sotez. When you look at the costume of those masquerades, it looked like Shakespeare masks because all of them developed from speech masses that we have. We see throughout the Caribbean and not just Grenada or Trinidad where many of it, Trinidad stuff came from Grenada, but we see John Canoe in some of the other islands, um, in Antigua and, and, and the Bahamas and places like that, these that develop a speech masses, new spe- speech masquerades. Um, so the Shakespeare mass, of course, is quite interesting, and Shakespeare was not always its name. It actually had um, names like Pero, because we call it Pero, we thought it was derived from a clown, but actually, one other that um, another academic actually he said it was pay p-a-y-s r-o-i country king Mm -hmm. which more exemplifies illustrates yeah because that's what the shakespeare masquerade is it's like a king yes you know and not a clown yeah so there is that mix up in in because again the language was not a written language it was an oral language so when you interpret it you you when you try to look for a written form you took the one that you was more available yeah. and the word was clown as opposed to so there's a lot of mix up in how we look at you know shakespeare mass i think is is like shortening grenada mm-hmm. um and jab jab and uh, sh- um 
uh, Beku, you know, these are local creations based on historical things as well, that some of them taken from different sources. Um, when you look at the costumen, um, these are things that you, you try to figure out where it could have come from, what influences created this, you know, the, 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 the crown. Mm -hmm. you know and, and how that's made and you know the fact that in the crown there's a kata yeah. you know and that is a is a is a, a Ghanaian word it derives kata. from a Ghanaian word yeah. for the same thing in terms of you put that on your head to carry Carol. loads yeah. Load, yeah. yeah you know um i i know that from grenada you know like i remember in the garden my father would make a kata to put in your head to carry the cocoa mm -hmm. um, stuff like that so so i think there there are things coming from different places to create the creativity is happening in mm. these places right. you know i think um one of the interesting interpretations um of the shakespeare mass um, by uh, an artist that was part of the venice biennale where shakespeare was featured um, for the grenada pavilion um oliver um, benoit an uh, abstract artist he produced a series of of paintings called whip in the mind um and he connects the expression of shakespeare masquerades as um as as being connected to to British education. Don't worry folks. They just we just collecting congories. <laughs> they have a congaree sauce later. <laughs> so um so Oliver's interpretation is that um the, the the expression you see of um Shakespeare masqueraders in the in the villages and stuff um came directly from the classroom where in British edu colonial education, people were whipped to memorize, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, you know, from the old royal readers, which is where Shakespeare, Shakespeare. masquerade took their material from. Mm -hmm. So, which, you know, to me is like, that's an interesting explanation. Yeah. You know, which, you know, so there are different ways of, of looking at the possibility of how this masquerade developed, you know, um, that stick fighting is also something that yeah. you know that have lost been lost in grenada because they were banned because there was a lot of violence lot between of violence, these groups yeah, yeah. um that um but but the shakespeare mass have found a way you know to interweave it into its its its, its expression now so they did never got rid of their their stick they basically made it acceptable because it's just beaten on a on a big yeah um Crown. Crown, yeah, yeah, that insulates them from, from, from the violence the yeah. itself. Mm -hmm. You know, so we talk the early nineteen hundreds is when we see the, the, the outlawing of of um um sticks in in these because people died. We actually have a case I think in like nineteen oh two, something like that, where they reported that somebody died. You know, they, I think the guy's name was Hanky that died from playing at sticks. That's okay. what they used to call it. Mm -hmm. You know, a bois. Not a bois, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's Trinidad right. is prominent yes. still. Right, yeah. right. Because again, it's all these Grenadians and so going, going to Trinidad. To Trinidad. Yeah. With these, that's why in Trinidad, one of the original masquerades, they still call it Pierrot Grenade. Pierrot Grenade. Right. And they have the Grenade mm -hmm. still there telling you where it came from. Right. You know, we don't even do the Pierrot Grenade anymore. It's gone. Yeah. You know, because ours have evolved into other things mm. like the short knee and, and the Shakespeare the and all things right. like that. Lovely. You know, so I think we have, you know, all of these expressions. For me, if you decide that you don't want to do the Shakespeare because it somehow represents um, European or whatever, you are neglecting the journey or you're disregarding the journey of your ancestors mm -hmm. because they're the ones that created it. Of and like course. I said, you might disagree with the conditions under which it was done. Yeah. But that is their expression. That, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and to, to, to deny to deny that is almost like denying them because mm -hmm. that's their creativity. They put this together with all of the things they were played, despite being forced to, to deal with the royal reasons. You know, they took things from it and they reinvented it when they created the Shakespeare Mass, when they go through the street and recite Julius Caesar. Yeah. yeah. You know, so I think you need to look at it in a different perspective and recognize that it is part of Karaku's identity. Yeah. To yeah. erase that is erasing part of Karaku's identity. Well, you will stay as long as we are alive on our... We we will make sure that stays with us. Right. Yeah. You feel because you feel strongly because you see exactly. it as part of who you are. Very much. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure if Betty has any question there, but 
before we wrap up, I just want you to speak about your experience with the Biennial. Biennale, Ex- Biennale Expo, mm-hmm. right. and the fact that uh, after it's finished, there will be an expo in Karakum. Right. Fingers right. crossed. Right. Come back and showcase uh, w- what you did yeah. over there. Right. You're just coming from there. Tell us what it was like um, and what that means for Karakum. Right. It was a unique opportunity for me because I am not an artist. Well, I am a different type of artist, mm-hmm. I guess you can say. Um, I was brought in as a historian mm-hmm. to do research on the Shakespeare Masquerade, which is where I contacted you guys, yeah. who are in Karaku and who works with the Masquerade. Yeah. Um, and coincidentally, um, Grenada was looking to get listed, a UNESCO listing for the Shakespeare Mask. So Rena and you were doing all this research, interviewing people. Yeah. So basically, we were just lucky at that point to just say hey we didn't have to come and look for the material you guys Rina already she have it. yes just <laughs> like rena and rena i said i remember talking to rena i said okay start writing something and then we'll go from there and then she sent me some stuff and we basically ended up with a good nice history looking at some of the the, the possibilities and trying to explain different aspects yeah. of it so when we got together as a group and, and for the Venice Biennale, all of the discussions happened over Zoom because it was during COVID. Right. Um, so we started exploring. The idea was once we learned about Shakespeare Masquerade, how can artists now interpret that in the expression of their art? So either um, painting, sculpture, whatever it was, um, even film, mm-hmm. you know, how do you take from that, use that as your inspiration and, and, and share that with the world, basically, which is what the Venice Biennale is. Mm-hmm. And Grenada had appeared multiple times at the Venice Biennale, but this was the first time that a local um, cultural, Culture. in, intangible cultural piece was actually used as inspiration um, to express, for these artists to express their Grenadians, mm-hmm. however they can, you know. Um, Wonderful. And, 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 and for the first time, you have a Grenadian masquerade at the Venice Biennale, and for all the way from what April all the way to November, that it's there and people visit it, people comment about it, and all of that. So there are these artistic. There's a film that you did for that we used that you and um, did for the listing that was sent to UNESCO um, that we basically used, and that's the first thing they see when they walk in. There's a costume you know that we got um and that's on display Mm -hmm. and then you walk in and you see other art that reflects some of that as well Uh you know so that's probably one of the the coolest things that i've been part of you know because i saw how we work with people in karaku to take it all the way to venice and the hope is that it comes back to karaku and get displayed in karaku so people in karaku can actually see what it was that was taken from here to Venice to share with the art world and, and bring that back to Karaku and, and share that with people from Karaku um, to know that their creation, again, their creation is something we use to, to express other creation um, um, into the world. And, you know, want showing people what this tiny island, the Grenadines, which many people may not have even known about, um, can now say, Ah, Karaku when they hear it, they don't mix it up with Curacao or something like that. You know, that they know that it's responsible. Oh, Shakespeare Mars, yes. You know, that kind of thing. I saw saw many articles regarding the experience and regarding the showcase, Mm -hmm. and uh, I'm really thrilled about it. And I just want to big up my manager this time, Mrs. Carla Hashtali Grant, and she always been behind this. Big up yourself, (laughs) Carla. Thank yeah. you very much to you, Mr. Angus. Anything Thank else? you for having Any me. Any questions before we close? One one person wants to know um, where the last name Dufont came from. Dufont. Well, Dufont. it's French. Um, I would have to specifically look and see if there was somebody with that name, Dufont. Oh, okay. Um, and it could be, like I said, a lot of um, mixed race people took part of the French name. So somebody may have been so-and-so. We have like... La Roche, there's something or whatever, you know, and people to end up the mixed race children end up taking part of that name. 
for example, I think in Grenada we have um, the Cloger family. They were a very prominent Grenadian family. There's Cloger d'Arcel, Cloger de Coteau, Cloger Chantimel. Mm -hmm. We have a place name in Grenada called Chantimel. We have many Grenadians with the name de Coteau. De Coteau. So they didn't take the whole Cloger de Coteau after their father, but they took just the de Coteau yes, part. Right. So all of them derive from that line. Okay. Um, and many of them, the reason why we don't have any Chantimels anymore and any other Darcells is because many of the men either were killed or died during Fedon's Rebellion. The Clojure family, the extended family, were probably the most prominent family, um, French family and French de extent derived family, both mixed race and white, that took part in Fedon's Rebellion. Often joke that it should be renamed the, the Clojure Rebellion. As a, because there were just so many. We're talking over 25 members of the family uh, and we see the disappearance of some of the names because all the men either were killed or died. Yeah. 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 While you were speaking about that, it reminded me about a question I meant to pose. Mm -hmm. There are some British names, village names in Caracol and mm -hmm. some French. Can you speak about a few of them? Right. Um, we know places like Les Fairs. Um, so Lance La Roche. French. Those are the French names. Mm -hmm. um, and, and basically, when you look at when you look at um, any map of Grenada, Caracol, Petit Martinique, you see the the two sets of names. So when the French came, they of course took took over and made put their names into in place of the Calinago names. Mm -hmm. But we do have a few Calinago names: Mineri, you know, Bacolets. So we do have a few Levera that are derived from, from Kalinago, but in general, most of the names, actually 60% of the names of Grenada, and between 50 and 60% is still French, mm -hmm. because the French name the rivers, the streams, and the mountains. Right. So everything else derived from that. Okay. So that's why we have so many French names, and, and so many of them remain. And I think it's interesting though, that the people who maintain those names are the enslaved people. That, I think, is, is, is one of the interesting. We normally don't think of them as having agency. But look at a place like Guave. The French tried to remain, rename it Charlottetown, but it was never accepted. Mm -hmm. And Grenville is known also as Labé, mm -hmm. you know, because the people decided we're going to keep that name. Right. You know, so I think um, when you look at Karakou, you do see um, French names. Um, you probably see a lot more English names there or, or Scottish. The, you look at the Scottish one specifically, um, Hillsborough is not Scottish. That one's after a specific politician, um, British politician who was prominent in the 1760s. So that's where the name came from. Um, Craigston were named from the Urquharts who basically, um, that was their plantation from Craigston Castle in Scotland. They had Meldrum as well, another Scottish name. Um, Munro had Lemle, which became Limle, you know, so Argyle and all Dumfries and, and those other names. Boucherjou. Boucherjou was the, the French one, Belvedere. Yeah. Okay, you know, okay, all of friend. those were the French ones. Right. And those remain because they just, a lot of French continue to own some of these. Okay. So the British ones would change and, and sometimes again it's not them naming the plantation that mm -hmm. sometimes they do actually name it that but sometimes it's just people associated with the owner right so you want you talk about oh it's like belvedere mm -hmm. you know because it's always been there or the, the owner's name lauriston or the robertson's so sometimes they named i think a lot of the ones that are named after places there would have been um given by it because I don't think anybody would say, oh, the Robertsons of Kendis. That was, they probably start referring to it like that. Because again, everybody want to recreate a part of where they came from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the enslaved people could not do that because they did not have any ownership to land. So we don't have any mm -hmm. places that are named African derived names, right. except maybe one in Grenada. Really? Kwakwa. Right. That is probably the only one that's an official name, but they're little village settings, mm. Makuba, right. you know, and things like that where you would find they're probably one or two in Karakou as well. Yeah. Just like little little spots. 
because you have people talking about all these little bays and stuff mm -hmm. that don't appear on official maps but they might have a name that might be associated with an African derived name or something like that. Right. You know, like Coffee House. Yeah, coffee. You know, yeah, that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. yeah. You know. Um, is Monk Pleasant Scottish? Monk Pleasant is probably, um, could be French. Okay. Pleasant. Yeah. Monk Pleasant. Monk Pleasant. Monk Pleasant. Monk Pleasant. Yeah. 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 Um, Mont Plaisir, we have in Grenada, um, but but a lot of the names here yeah, because the the Caracou was only settled for maybe we're talking 15 years with the French, even though many of them remained. But the Scots came in in large numbers and bought up a lot of the plantation because Caracou had many small properties. Right. But the British came and they just bought up and start making them bigger and bigger and yeah. bigger. Most of the plantations were beyond were below 100 acres. But you end up with a plantation like uh, Grand Bay being 500, I think, mm -hmm. or Limlay was over 500. So I remember Bel Air started with a small and then yeah. it became yeah. Yeah. So they ended 96. up they end up buying yes yeah. they end up buying up these other surrounding properties because a lot of the French wanted to leave, mm -hmm. and they would go off to Saint Lucia, which was still French. Um, Mr. Teddy Christopher is saying that his lands in Omites were called Zulu Mountain. Right. So unfortunately, we're not recording those, okay. which I think is really sad yeah. because that tells its own story. So if we just remember Hermitage, and actually Hermitage goes back to the French, to the French. as Hermitage, Hermitage, you know. So um, that was actually owned by a prominent English um, Scottish guy, you right. know, Bailey, where we go with Bailey's Bacalet. Bailey, right. the Bailey, the same family owned um, Hermitage. Um, mm. But the, the fact that he remembers it the com people in the community remember these names, but we don't record them. Okay. They're going to disappear after a while, and we're going to lose that yeah. that story. That's a story. Yeah, no. Well, I think, I mean, we'll chit chat for a bit, but um, since Rina is so scared of the Congolese, <laughs> and we collect now. loads already to have a Congolese casserole, <laughs> you guys could get up and we'll take a little walk while we chit chat. Before he walks, I wanted him to speak about something. Tomorrow, please, sir. Mm -hmm. I see on Facebook that you're having a session tomorrow, please, sir. Yeah. Not uh, tomorrow. Sure. On oh, No, in the morning we have a radio. But no, that session is on Sunday. Sunday. Oh, Sunday. Sunday. Yeah. Sunday in Grenada. Maybe I'm too excited. At, um, True Blue Bay Resort is right. a presentation on my, from my dissertation. I remember um, the last time it was a Friday, so maybe that's where yes, I thought. Yes, yes, yes. So, well, um, we, 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 we should go down for that. Right? Sunday. Sunday. It's Sunday. That's my birthday. <laughs> it's always birthday every day. No, Sunday no, it's legally my birthday. It's really? Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, well, you may see us on Sunday, guys. <laughs> would you want to be doing that on your birthday? Hello. A, I would stay around Mr. Time. Angus Martin for the next hundred years to come. All right. So we'll do that. <laughs> That's your birthday wish. We're flying down Saturday. And, all right. Yippee! All right. So let's take this. Oh, invite persons on the live. So, so look at this. Um, I Facebook. don't think it's going to be streaming. Oh, I don't think okay. it's going to be streaming. When um, I saw the fly, I thought. I yeah, thought. no. We the last time we did stream the one. Uh, um, but so we, what? So uh, someone has to pay to go in. No, no, no. It's a free. Um, you know, and well, we we'll come and stream it then. It's a... <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah. Let's take a walk. Yeah. But it's that that would be looking at uh, basically um, relates stories of multiple in the verse identities from Grenada starting with the Kalinago and looking at individuals who would have identified with Grenada and how that identity what it meant for them um, looking at individuals like Maurice Bishop or Eric Gary you know um, and what it what what these identities would have mean so I'm trying to recreate these identities and of Grenada basically uh, of the Grenadian landscape You know, I could walk with you, you know, Mr. Angus. I could walk with you. Because I would have done that long time. But I thought you were scared of them, so. Oh, no, no, not me. I know the snake's going to be running far from me, so I'm not worried about it. Uh, me too. The snake's running from me. The snake is scared of me, which is the only time you're going to get a snake. Well, they're scared of me and I'm scared of them. Two of us running. <laughs> Yeah, so. Yeah, and this is, you know, you just. Know you know a man called Mr. Ali pa yeah. Pascal? Huh? What's your proof for that? <laughs> <laughs>
Be careful. <laughs> Say that again. Mr. Ali Pascal is saying thank you basically for offering to stream the event on Sunday. <laughs> you see, you just got yourself a job. I know. Huh? <laughs> I was commenting on right ahead of us is this wonderful example of um, windmill tower, a sugar windmill tower um, that would have been built probably in the early 1800s, um, which would have been built by enslaved people. Uh, so one can see it as a monument to the enslaved people who we had the names for, mm -hmm. that they would have built this structure that still stands today. Um, 200 years, 19, almost, yeah, 200 years yeah. that this would have been standing for and look at its condition, um, despite yeah. being neglected. Um, but it is a good example of our um, slave plantation landscape that remains and, and, and we should at least acknowledge it being there and interpret it so that people are aware of what this meant and you know and what the workers would have had to do you know to build it and to, to run it and i think i think a lot of the structures in the bush here is a really good example um, of that in this area we could at least find a way to talk about slavery because yes. i think we don't talk about slavery uh, we don't really do much about slavery we talk about slavery in the Northern Caribbean yes. and not about Romania um, and people are unaware of what took place in Romania specifically and we do have a lot of data on it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know and we could tell stories we do know about you know one of the things is the great stone that we found yeah. and you guys have found of coffee mm -hmm. you know Kojo, Kojo. And we need to take a look and see if we can actually find out more about this person. Were there, was that person an enslaved person because they died in 1823 and leaving a headstone? Or was that person maybe free? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we probably can try and look and see if we can identify. I don't think it's wrong though. Was. I think some people know about it. I, I been, know that a lot of people have been speaking about, about it. it. Right, we right. haven't even gone and see it yet, but I know a lot of people have been speaking about that about stone it. from yeah. ages. Right. Yeah. yeah, I've heard about it. I've read about it. Story. I've read about it in, yeah. in um, Donald Hill. Uh -huh. I think wrote about it. And then um, I remember Mr. Fleury. Yes. Winston yes. Fleury. Yes. He spoke about it. Yeah, he's the one, one of I his think, documentaries. Right. He's the one I think I saw that talked about it mm -hmm. quite a bit. You know, but we have never really done the research to yes. try and find out um, who so this you person started is. It. Well, I'm going to take a look at it. I'm going to give it a shot. You know, um, it's a unique spelling of the word. Yes. The what's written on the stone again. Yes. People were not. -E. People were not the best spellers. You yeah. know, you find in the same paragraph they spell the name four different places. Mm. You true. know, spelling was the That's accuracy true. was not important. That's you true. got it down on paper. That my, was it. My grandmother, uh -huh. she was a Lawrence, uh -huh. and uh, her parents they were Lawrence. Right on the stone, on the, which was the French, and yes. then you got the British one. To yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a common thing. You pick up what mm -hmm. you know, what you see around. Yeah, yeah. So and of course, welcome to one of the most historical villages in Caracobella, of course. Bella, yes. Where else will you find two sugar mills in one two village? Two mills. Small, two small, mills. Small, one two sugar mills. And one windmill. <laughs> All right, two windmills. We have a bad yes, way of saying sugar mills. Yes. But they are windmills. They are windmills. Yes. One was and you can feel the wind up the here. We've, since calm. we've come up yes. here, you can feel the wind blowing. Yeah. Hence the reason it's and bel -air, reason it. beautiful bel -air. air. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> All right, yeah. Mr. Nick and Cox, if you look at the caption, it says the historian, Mr. Angus Martin. Oh. We are having a chit chat with the great. I don't call him an historian. <laughs> Sir Angus Martin. Yeah. I'll show sure make. Mr. Uh, make the queen, the not king, the king. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Of I might, course, I, I might have it. to, I might have to turn it down, unfortunately. Then give it to me then. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we are chit chatting with Mr. Angus Martin, oh, yeah. historian. We were just about to wrap up, though. Yeah, we are wrapping up. We're just giving you guys a pictorial view. We just walked out from the PRA After camp. The sugar mill in Karaku. In yeah. the village of Bele, of course. Yeah, it is. The sugar mill to my right, and the PRA camp to my left. So this, it has a the area has this long history. Uh -huh. Quite interesting. Of course. Um, that ends up even that it was a PRA camp, People's yes. Revolutionary Army. Mm -hmm. You know, back uh, 1983, 1979 to 83, 83, which adds this new. You know, this old sugar plantation became the site of a PRA a camp. You know, I know. Um, adding another dimension to the history, and it shows you, you know, the the places we live, 
you know, can take on so many different things throughout its history, history. and yeah. they represent us, of you course. know, despite one being bad or whatever, you know, they still become part of who we are. And Bella has both French and English right. history. Right. The Great House down at the bottom. At, yeah, at the yeah. park. Mm. French. Yeah, so, you get it from right here, girl. Of course. Me too. I'm born in Bele. Everybody born in Bele. <laughs> Not everybody. Oh, yeah, okay, long ago, some people, they born at home, right? At home oh, yeah, and en route to the, yeah, to the hospital. hospital, yeah. yeah. For the midwife. Yeah, I love yeah. someone that she was on the way to the hospital and right on the... Because they, they had to walk long ago. Because yeah, yeah. Vehicle, yeah. Right, right, right on right. our house there. Yeah. Wow. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's, oh my God, it's been a not... pleasure. Um, We've been speaking about this for, for years, for you know. years, for years, and yeah. finally. Because I did come it's... some years ago. I actually did a tour with some two, of some, course, some school kids. Remember it was Rina, Rina brought me up to do that. <laughs> so, and you know, in, in what I find interesting, that I learn something new every time I do this stuff as well. Uh -huh. Because you see something and you ask the question, "What is this?" Mm -hmm. You know, I remember one of the things I did learn is that Karaku actually has a different plant that it calls Zuti that we don't have in Grenada. Mm, of course. You don't have Zuti in Grenada? We have Zuti, but not the Zuti you call Zuti. Mm -hmm. no, I didn't know, just the yeah, one I it was up here, yeah. up here I saw it. Yeah. So Look at right behind you guys. Yeah, the big leaf one. Mm -hmm. yeah. We don't call that Zuti in Grenada. I don't even know if we have it here. I'll have to check and see. So, yeah. yeah. I'll have to bring down some. <laughs> no, you didn't keep it. It's okay. We have you. <laughs> All right, so thank you very much again, Mr. Thank you. Angus Machine. I mean, we've been speaking about this for ages and finally came into being. See you, November, God will. Yes. He'll be back up. He'll be doing a trading for us at GTA with taxi operators, tour guides. And if you on the live and you want to be part of it, you can join us well. Or if someone on the live and you know somebody that wants to be part of it, they can join us well. Let's learn about our history. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you oh. for having me. It was a pleasure. Folks, thank you. Thank, thank you. you for viewing. Thank you for viewing. <laughs> and Shay, listen, I am I can't wait to get back in to put this on telly and re watched it. Yeah. Because I missed a lot. <laughs> thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Wow.